What's up everyone, it's Scotty with MoneyVest. So in this video, I wanted to go over markets uh, expectations of the bond trade. And of course, uh, there's a few strategic calls that I wanted to go over from Tom Lee, from Dan Ives uh, about the tech sector and how and what they're expecting towards the end of this year. And also draw some con conclusions uh, based on a report that I read from 2020 and 2023 and where we are in the current situation, whether we're in an inflationary environment or a deflationary environment environment so hope you guys enjoy this video and find it helpful if you do make sure that you drop a like i would really appreciate it subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and links to our discord and patreon is going to be down below if you're interested in joining and of course getting access to all the members only benefits uh, videos uh, you know all the intrinsic value spreadsheets volatility spreadsheets s p 500 valuations um trading view charts everything's going to be included with that 16 percent annual discount that's also available with the link down below so we'd love to have you on board and uh, without further ado let's get started so as we know tom lee uh you know very very bullish and so is dan ives on the tech sector so we got to Definitely take that with a grain of salt. I'm also going to go over the valuation, which we have already discussed, you know, in our previous uh, updates. But this right here came from Jason 15 hours ago. He mentioned that there have been two times in the past 40 years when the S&P 500 rose for seven straight days following a 100-day low. And the first was on March 20th, 2003. It marked the end of the bear market. And the second time was literally just in the last couple of days as the markets have been on a very strong uh, streak of consistent gains. If you come over to the daily chart, uh, you'll notice that we have seen nothing but a green candle after green candle. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have already printed, right? So seven straight days following a 100 day low because we did hit a 52 week low once the S&P 500 came down to 4,100. So, so that's where we are. Um, you know, at the moment, so actually we did not hit a 52 week low, but we did hit a 100 day low. 52 week low would have been an entire yearly low, but 100 day low we did hit uh, because we were obviously going back as far as July and we were selling off since then. So, of course, time will tell. But again, just two data sets in 40 years is not enough to extrapolate any type of bias towards the upside or the downside. So I want to keep that in mind that just because it happened in 2003 and marked the bottom or the end of the bear market doesn't mean it's going to happen again. Yes, it's a, yes, it's a good data point to look at. But of course, there's a lot of other variables at play and the market circumstances are completely different. Uh, Dan, I was also mentioned that uh, he says, and I quote, we believe this is the beginning of the next bull market, tech bull market. And uh, I think tech stocks are up another 10 to 12 percent this year is what he mentioned. And a key theme for this tech earnings season has been that AI monetization is now hitting the shores of technology with Microsoft, Datadog and Palantir all delivering robust results, giving further confirmation AI use cases are expanding across the enterprise. And I did a video on Palantir. I did a video on Datadog as well. So make sure that you do check out those videos. The results were indeed very good. And you can see that Microsoft, um, you know, getting up to almost all time highs. It's been on a very nice consistent streak and rallies. Palantir, same thing, didn't quite break down from this head and shoulders, but it's just been on a very nice move higher. And Datadog, I did a video on earlier today. So definitely do check that out, but a very nice gap up 28% after the earnings reported and lifting their guidance for fiscal year 23 as well. So um, of course, time will tell whether this technology boom and this artificial intelligence monetization continues, which it will. I have no doubt that AI has got a lot of potential and uh, there will be this consistent new stream of revenue, new stream of opportunities for businesses. But at some point, we also have to ask ourselves a simple question of what's the appropriate valuation for artificial intelligence? I mean, yes, these companies are reporting robust earnings, but at the end of the day, Palantir is trading at 200 times earnings, Datadog is trading at 70 times earnings, Palantir is trading at over 20 times sales, Datadog is trading at 16 times sales. So yes, while there is a argument to be made for uh, the idea that AI is huge and the monetization is robust and we are seeing very nice numbers. The against argument is at what valuation is it appropriate, right? What's the correct valuation? Because in my opinion, at least they are trading at quite expensive levels. Now, this right here is a question survey that was done by JP Morgan, which basically asked, are you more likely to increase or decrease equity exposure over the coming days and weeks? And this number, as you can see, has been going down. And of course, in June, July 23, it was really low. But as the markets have now started to recover back higher in October and November, currently we're looking at 67%. So more than half of investors are now looking at increasing uh, their exposure in the equity 
market, right? So that again goes to show that again, as markets are moving higher, there is going to be some more risk on environment. And that's also got to do something with the yields as well, right? The 10 year treasuries, because as they have continued to come down, that's created that risk on environment for investors to once again, flood back over to equities. And that has obviously created a little bit of that risk on environment. Now, flooding back to equities, you know, there's only a few names that people are going to because uh, year to date, we are still seeing the RSP, which is the equal weighted index, not not really going anywhere. So year to date, it's still, still guys, we are 10 months into the year and the RSP is still nowhere. It's down. It's flat down 1% on the year versus the S&P 500, which is now year to date up a little bit over 13.6%. And a lot of the gains, as we already know, have come on the back of big tech, magnificent seven stocks and Apple and Microsoft in the last uh, 40 plus years are now at their highest weighting in the S&P 500 at over 14.4%. And you can see that back in uh, 1980s, we had IBM and AT&T at almost 11%. Then we had Microsoft and GE at 9.1%. And we had XOM, which is Exxon Mobil and Walmart at 7.7%. And now we have Apple and Microsoft, 14.4% market weighting for S&P 500. And Magnificent 7 now makes up over 25. A quarter of the S&P 500 is literally Magnificent 7. Now we come to the bond trade, okay? We've talked about Howard Marks and Howard Marks is a legend when it comes to investing. We've talked about his books, The Most Important Thing. I've read it. I've summarized it in my other Money Vest Reads channel. So definitely do check that out if you haven't already. But he is talking about the credit market. Credit market meaning the bond market, right? Corporate debt, treasury debt, those are some things that he's referring to. And where where would he put investing dollars to work for the next 10 years if he had just turned 50 is the question. And the answer, Howard Marks says, and I quote, you can get very good returns with a high degree of certainty in credit. Uh, the bedrock of every portfolio should always be equities. In the longer run, you want to invest in the global economy and the performance of leading global corporations. You should ne go, never get away from that. Uh, but he said credit simply needs to be made a bigger part of the portfolios after a sea of change that halted a four decade decline in interest rates. And he says, and I quote, I don't think this is the time to invest in credit. I think this is a time to invest in credit. Um, and of course, we've had a lot of popular asset strategies, which consists of buying assets with board money. You have to have something wrong with you not to do well. But my essential message is that's over. And the key is today you can get equity returns from credit and that changes a lot, right? And what he's saying is that you can actually get corporate debt. You can buy corporate debt at seven, eight, nine percent coupons. And that is equity like returns, but you're getting that from credit. So 21 months ago, high yield bonds yielded 4%. Today, they yield over 9%, right? So 9% plus changes everything. Uh, and investors should expect Fed funds rate to come down some, but not stabilize at 0.5%, such as in 2009 or 2021. And he also added that 9% plus is the, quote, lowest aspiring of all of our strategies. And investors who, who can lock their money for a few years in private credit can earn double digit return. So that's really where a lot of the thesis is coming from. And you know, this is going to be kind of like playing in chronological fashion where investors kind of look for higher rate of return in the credit market, corporate or treasuries. And as they go into that market, yields come down and then equities become more attractive relative to bonds. And then liquidity floods over to equities once again and becomes a more risk on environment. So this is kind of like the chronological fashion where I'm expecting it to, you know, play out. And Wayne Whaley on Twitter also tweeted this, uh, the 40 year performance of the 30 year bond yield between November 6th and November 26th. So in the next 20 days, how the yields have performed. And you'll notice that majority of the times they have come down. Most years they have pulled back, uh, you know, at least by 20 to 30 basis points. Uh, some years, uh, you know, less, some years more. But the bottom line is very, very few years. Uh, you know, in the last uh, 20 years, there's only been one year, 2016, when the actual 30-year bond yield was up in the month of November from 20th to the 26th by 45 basis points. Um, every single other year, they're down 17, 19, 17, 37, 64 basis points in 2008, 15 basis points in 2009, 49 basis points um, in 2022. So that's again, 0.49% so, or half a percent. Um, so if this continues, obviously that's going to create uh, some more demand for, for the bond market because investors can start panic buying um, and that can lead to some more potential for equities and for tech stocks as well, which again brings us back to the call from Dan Ives and Tom Lee, suggesting there is more potential upside for, 
for tech and innovation. Now, bond yields are trading well above economic realities, such as not sustainable given the underlying fundamentals of credit. Either yields will fall or economic growth is about to explode higher. So this is basically going over the 10-year treasuries with the U.S. manufacturing PMI and how consistent they've been in the past several, several years. And there is a big divergence right now. So this, again, is a tweet from Lance Roberts suggesting that, you know, either the yields start coming down or growth is about to explode higher. And I do think it's going to be the former where the yields start rolling over uh, and, and getting more more aligned with what we have seen in the past. Now, finally, going over some inflation factors from 2020. This was another report that I was able to find. So, uh, you know, this basically created that huge sentiment, huge uh, increase in inflation in 2020 because money supply at the time was up 20%, which was inflationary. Uh, monetary velocity was down 18% year to date because, again, everybody was working from home. So there wasn't a lot of transactions that were happening in person. So that was disinflationary or deflationary. And Fed's balance sheet was up 66%, which was inflationary. Fed funds rate was down from 1.5 to 0%, inflationary. Government deficit was $2.45 trillion from January through July, which was inflationary. Supply lines and means of production broken, inflationary. Personal savings rate rose to 468%. So people had a lot of a lot of savings on the sidelines, inflationary. And finally, crude oil also did fall down significantly, which was inflationary as well. So monetary velocity, a proxy for aggregate demand, was weak for a short period, but virtually everything else happening in the economy was inflationary. Once it stabilized, inflation took off. And now, now there's people suggesting that the Federal Reserve is not paying attention to the current situation as of October 2023, where money supply is down 2.25%, which is disinflationary or deflationary. Money velocity is up 5%, which is not by a huge amount, but it's still up. Could be inflationary. Fed's balance sheet is down. As we know, they've been rolling over their assets from their balance sheet, 7% year to date. Again, disinflationary or deflationary. Fed funds rates, 5.3%. Significant amount of quantitative tightening happening. So again, that's disinflationary or deflationary. Government deficit, once again, running through January through July, 1.2 trillion, less inflationary, and supply lines and means of production fully healed, no marginal effect. Personal savings fell 9% year to date, disinflationary, deflationary, and crude oil also hovering around $85 per barrel, which is $20 above the five-year average. Again, disinflationary and deflationary as well. So it is now three and a half years after the pandemic shock, and almost all the factors above have become disinflationary or deflationary. However, there is one outlier monetary velocity, and it's currently inflationary. And the reason for that is because the reason why we're having so many transactions is because of debt, right? Debt levels are really high, and the U.S. economy pretty much depends on constant spending on the back of credit, right? Credit gives the economy the health of the economy drives by consumer spending is what he's talking about in this report. And that's obviously driving debt levels to extreme levels. As we know, credit card debt, mortgage debt, auto loans, everything's been ripping higher and that's creating a higher monetary velocity. But in reality, everything else is disin disinflationary or deflationary, which again, could lead to potentially rate cuts in the future and could lead to stocks and tech stocks more specifically, and even the bond trade, long duration uh, equities and fixed income to, to see that momentum back higher. So that's where we are. I did pick up some more TMF today. Um, let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. But uh, but yeah, in terms of valuation, you know, I would I would say the S&P 500 is not ideal from a deal standpoint, but it's it's reasonable trading at 19, 19 and a half times earnings, still close to its 10, 25 and 15 year averages. Uh, but let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. What do you think? What I'm personally doing right now still holding off on cash. Money market funds are still paying pretty decent numbers, uh, but at the same time, dollar cost averaging into broad based diversified funds, but at the same time, also holding out on the uh, the bond trade, which I do believe is going to pay off in 2024. We'll find out, but that's where I'm personally putting my money. So hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you found it helpful, make sure that you drop a like. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel link to our Discord and Patreon is going to be down below if you're interested in joining and of course getting access to all the members only benefits. Uh, link's going to be down below. As always, happy investing. I'll see you all in the next video.